Okay, well, hopefully you put your answer in the chat by now. Uh, or maybe you're still typing just one more minute. Please put your answer in the chat. All right, I think we got almost everybody. Please put your answers in the chat. Okay. So I'm taking a picture of who's here today. Ha <laughs> ha. No, I. <laughs> it's, all right. So let's talk about the first one. All right, we do have a positive particle and the let's see we put our hands in the direction of v and if b is going downwards then it looks like if we do the right hand rule the force will be coming out in the positive z direction so uh out of the page oh somebody said my answers are opposite that's okay um as long as we figure it out. So um, yes, make sure that we understand it. It, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes, but uh, that's okay. Uh, Cause we do have the positive and negative charge. All right, so the, I think the first one is coming out of the page. I think, let's see what people said. Uh, yes, uh, that looks like what most people got. Oh, that's good. All right, so uh, let's look at the next one. Okay, V is, uh, pointing downwards, and this is a B is a negative particle, it's negatively charged. So, if we curl in the direction of B, the our thumbs would be going to the right, okay? But it's negative, so uh, maybe that means it's going to the left towards, yeah. So, toward B is towards the negative x axis because that is a uh, a negative particle, so it's opposite the right hand rule. So remember what you, the right hand rule will tell you the direction, but if it's negative, has to be opposite. And then most of you, it looks like, let's see, uh, yes, the, uh, for part C, looks like most people have it correctly. Since V and B are anti-parallel meaning they're going in the same direction if we did v cross b uh that means there shouldn't be any force okay because sine of 180 is uh zero so there should not be any force on that one um and that's a really important point because you you can't slow a charged particle down by putting a magnetic field on it in the um in the opposite direction. So you cannot accelerate it and you can also can't slow it down. Um, the, only, the only way you can, the only way that the force can act on it is perpendicular. So uh, you cannot accelerate a charged particle with a magnet. You can't get linear acceleration, okay? So that means you can't make it go faster. You can change its direction, but you can't slow it down. Um, now, uh, we know from quantum mechanics that when charged particles accelerate, they do lose a little bit of energy. Uh, but if it had a big velocity, this wouldn't really be significant. Um, so for our intents and purposes for classical electric electricity and magnetism, we're not going to worry about that. When you get to quantum mechanics, that's important. Also, well, actually, maybe we should worry about it because that's how radio towers work. So if you ever wondered how... Uh, or why uh, those those big radio towers are everywhere? Well, it's because what they do is they send a charge up and down really quickly, and when you do that, it will uh, it radiates and so it gives off an electromagnetic signal. So when you look at those radio towers, the reason they're so tall is because that is one quarter of the wavelength of uh, a radio wave. So 
Uh, that means that radio waves are very, very long. They have a huge wavelength, okay? So if that radio tower is 100 meters tall, or maybe 50 meters tall, then the wavelength is probably like 200 meters. So radio waves are very long. They're very low energy, and so they probably don't do, uh, they don't really cause cancer. Uh, now, if you think about your cell phone, I don't have my cell phone with me, but your cell phone is much smaller. So if there's an antenna on that, it also uses the same principle. Uh, it sends charges back and forth really quickly. It accelerates them in a linear way. And uh, by applying a, an electric field of, of voltage, and when you do that, it, it radiates, okay? And um, it's about on the same dimension as your, as your phone. So we're talking about centimeters, which is microwaves. Uh, now, somebody, we talked about 5G the other day, and what I read something really interesting about 5G, and that is if you go to higher energy uh, above uh, microwaves, um, the question is, would you be able to get more data? Yes, but the problem is that those electromagnetic waves don't travel as far. So if you try to go to a higher frequency, it cuts down... Uh, it cuts down on your range. So um, what's gonna happen with 5G is, uh, even if they do move to this higher bandwidth, uh, if, you, if you go away from a big city, you won't be able to get that range. So really, we're kind of stuck with 4G for long distances, and 5G is really not gonna be too much of a higher frequency because those shorter wavelength ones, uh, photons, they don't really travel that far. So if you get a phone that says it's 5G, it's probably just 4G, uh, the, the same type of speed. 4G is kind of the limit of how fast we can send data, but there might be other things that they call 5G because everybody wants a 5G phone. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's probably just the same as 4G, but they call it 5G. And unless you're within maybe 20 feet of the tower, you're, you're kind of too far. So if you were standing right next to it, it might be a little bit faster, but uh, if you go far away from the tower, it's 4G. All right, so we can represent magnetic field lines as we did for electric field lines. Similar rules apply. Okay, the direction of the tangent to the magnetic field line uh, at any point gives the direction of B at that point. We drew a picture of that. And again, the spacing of the magnetic field lines determines its strength. So if you have field lines really close together, then you're going to have a, a very strong magnetic field. If they're, uh, otherwise, they're, if they're spread out, then um, not so much, okay? So um, we always have two poles, north and south. Uh, with your compass, they always align with the Earth magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is always prevalent. We cannot get rid of it. Uh, and it is, it's pretty significant, All right? Um, so here's a, here's a detailed picture of our, uh, what the magnetic field from a bar magnet would look like. Um, if we use this, we can put iron filings on there and they will align themselves with the magnetic field due to the magnet. So if you have little pieces of iron, iron is magnetic and, um, it will align itself with the Earth's magnetic field. Now, some people, when they go to the grocery store, they buy these little magnets and they put them on their head, like maybe you know, I'll put a magnet over here and I'll put a magnet over here. And now I, there's magnetic fields in my brain. Is it doing anything therapeutic? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, does the magnetic field penetrate into your brain? Yes. So now I have a magnetic field in my brain. Uh, does it do anything? I don't know. Let's try this bigger electromagnet. Let's see what happens when Dr. Wisby puts a magnetic field in his brain. Does he perceive it at all? Okay, I'm gonna I get this a little bit closer. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this for science. Does the magnetic field affect my brain? Hmm, the magnet is at full strength now. And I feel absolutely nothing. Uh, this is and this is a, a decent strength magnet. Uh, so it's full strength in my brain. Uh, I don't experience any different thoughts. So I would say no. 
the uh, magnetic field has no effect on your brain whatsoever. Uh, so do you, I, nothing happened. Um, uh, so is it a good idea to buy those therapeutic magnets at the grocery store? No, they don't do anything. Uh, your body is not really sensitive to magnetic fields. Do you have iron in your body? You might say, Dr. Risby, iron is magnetic. That's true. However, uh, iron oxide and hemoglobin is not really magnetic. So even though it has iron, it's not magnetic. Uh, there are certain elements that are magnetic, like iron. It can't be iron oxide. Iron oxide is not really magnetic. Uh, other elements like gadolinium, because they have an orbital with unpaired electrons, those electrons will line up together. And when they do that, uh, then it creates a bigger magnetic field. Now, when I say those electrons are lining up together, what am I talking about? Because maybe I mentioned that. But each little electron has its own magnetic field. This is something that we call spin, okay, which is really important in quantum mechanics. And I want to tell you a little bit about spin because I, I like to talk about spin. It's one of my favorite things in physics. Okay? Uh, and the reason they call it spin is uh, when, they were, when they started thinking about uh, quantum mechanics, they realized that magnets have a, a little magnetic moment. Okay, so here's my electron. Sorry, maybe I said magnets, I meant electron. So here's my electron, this is a really big picture. Um, what they thought was, well, uh, they noticed that electrons produce a little magnetic field. So each electron has its own magnetic field. It does. We can measure this in a lab. Um, and uh, so we'd say it's, uh, <coughs> its magnetic moment is pointing up in this direction. Uh, and if you get a bunch, and this is called something, it's called spin. And it's basically a little magnetic field that is inherent in each electron. Uh, we don't really understand it or know what it is, but it has some uh, interesting uh, properties, okay? Because when all of the spin, so this, the magnetic moment, just like a, a magnet, it's got a, a north side and a south side, okay? Well, if you get a bunch of electrons and you align all their spins together, okay, their magnetic fields add together now, okay? So now you have like one big magnetic field here. And this is what produces a, a stable magnet. So like a, a ferromagnet. So my little uh, magnet here, all of the electrons, their magnetic moments are pointing in the same direction. And originally, the reason that they called this property spin was because they thought, well, uh, okay, uh, if electrons uh, have some charge, maybe what's happening is whatever the charge is, is spinning in a circle. So the uh, electrons would be spinning like little tops and all the charge would be on the outside. Maybe it's like a little conducting ball. So each electron is like a little conducting ball and it's spinning around. But then uh, later, well, physicists realized that as far as we can tell, uh, electrons don't have any radius, okay? So there's nothing there that's actually spinning. It can't be because if it was, uh, it would have to be spinning faster than the speed of light. Nothing in our universe can travel faster than the speed of light. So if the electron was actually made up of some little charge ball, or whatever those charges would be, it'd have to be spinning really fast. Since its radius is tiny, that would mean that the surface would be moving faster than the speed of light. That can't be. Um, nothing can move faster than the speed of light. So what that means is that whatever causes the magnetic field is something inherent in each electron. Whatever that spin is, uh, it's something inside of the electron that uh, it's just an inherent property of an electron, which is a lepton, which is one of the most fundamental particles that we know of. You can't split an electron into pieces. People have tried. You can break up a proton, you can have a collision, but as far as we know, an electron cannot be broken down anymore and uh, it, is, it has no radius. There's absolutely no radius, no dimension at all. And so 
Whatever it is, is something inherent that is uh, inherent in an electron. And this is something that uh, was always fascinating to me, which is what I did my PhD about in physics. So I really like magnets. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, we did this experiment several times, uh, and maybe I'll do it again next time. But when a cathode ray fires a beam of electrons, if there is a, uh, a magnetic field, then you can control the direction of the spot. So I did this before. When I apply a magnetic field, then we can make our beam of electrons move in a circle. And if we have a, a strong magnetic field, the electrons can actually move completely in a circle. Um, and that's whenever the velocity crosses with the magnetic field. Okay, so next time we're gonna talk about the Hall effect, okay? Uh, the Hall effect is something very interesting. Uh, we know that when a current travels through a wire, if you apply a magnetic field, through that piece of metal, so our electrons are moving this way, all of the electrons, because of that force on the electrons, will be pushed to one side. And if you get a, a bunch of electrons building up on one side, so over here, so you can see that the negative charge is uh, collecting on this side, so our electrons will move over here, okay? Then we actually get a a voltage across our piece of metal. So next time we're gonna talk about the Hall effect and um, that's all we have for today. Thank you for coming to class today and thank you for staying until the end, I appreciate it. So I'm gonna stay here if you'd like to talk or you have questions about homework. Uh, if not, then I will see you later, you're free to go. So have a good day and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks for coming. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Dr. Wisby? Yes. Did you say that you are going to post a video covering the material that would have been last Friday? Yes, I am. I am going to do that tonight. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. You guys have any questions? Hey, Sean, did you have any questions? No, it's just about to leave. Oh, all right. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye. Um, bye. Thank you, like and subscribe down below.